Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Wendy Mitchell. I'm the editor of Screen International, and I'm thrilled to be moderating this conference, which is, I think, going to be a great discussion about adapting books for film. And we've got some a real variety of experts uh, from different backgrounds, which I think is going to give us a, a full circle view of, of what's going on with books and films today. So thank you, audience, for being here. We're, we're definitely going to open it up for some questions to hear what you're interested in talking about. Um, so if you've got a question even during the main part of the conference, just raise your hand, and uh, we want you to get involved. We don't want any pitches or anything of that sort from the floor, so please refrain from that. But um, other questions and interactions, we'll, we'll definitely want to hear. Um, I think this is a very topical conference because, uh, as we've just seen, Ang Lee won Best Director at the Oscars for Life of Pi, which was a book that was deemed unadaptable for a while. So I think we're going to talk a, a little bit about what works to adapt and the, the business realities of adapting books to film as well. Uh, I'm going to let each of the panelists give a short rundown about their background and some of their projects. And we'll start with Chaitan Bhagat, who is an Indian novelist. And there's a, a mic there for you, and he'll give us a little bit of his recent history. OK. Hi, everybody. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Three Idiots here. Uh, I, I heard it did well in Hong Kong, so it did, no? Um, but just very quickly on my background, I actually am very thankful to HKTDC. They keep calling me. Uh, I actually used to live in Hong Kong, uh, work in uh, Chung Kong, Chung Sum, in, uh, and I was, a, a bank, I was working in a bank here uh, for a long time in Goldman Sachs for a while and a couple of other places. And uh, I started writing books just as a hobby while in Hong Kong, in the Starbucks in Central. And uh, it, it, it took me a long time to get published. And I think when we talk of book to film adaptations, it's something that's happening in India only recently. Um, and partly the reason is there was no popular Indian literature in a big way. A lot of Indian literature in English uh, was targeted towards Booker Prizes or literary awards. And sometimes, of course, Life of Pi had won a Booker Prize and all that. but it's. It's difficult for those books. It is, and even Life of Why people considered was difficult, or it requires a certain uh, talent like Ang Lee to do it. Um, and therefore, there were not forget about. There were no popular books, so forget about book to film adaptations. Uh, my book was in the popular category, so it took a while for it to come out. Uh, but once it did, uh, that was the first book, Five Point Someone. It did really well, and from there, I just started uh, writing more books. I kept writing while still working at the bank. I wrote three books like that. Um, and now I've done five novels in all after quitting. Then I quit my job. Actually, my wife was working in the bank, so I thought, why do I have to work, right? With I realization struck very late. Um, and then after three books, I quit. And then we moved to India because my wife got a job in India. And wherever she goes, I go now. Um, and of course, it's my own country. Uh, so those three books have now been filmed. And the first book itself, which actually was uh, written in Hong Kong, became Three Idiots, which I think many of you have seen. Um, there was another adaptation which came even, but that didn't really do as well as Three Idiots. Three Idiots did extremely well in India. Uh, it became the highest, uh, highest grossing movie in Indian cinema of all time. It had a very big star also. And I think that, that movie was done as a star vehicle. So they changed the book quite a bit to suit the star. Because the star had to have the best lines. The star, in my book, the underdog gets the girl. But in a movie, you can't do that in India. The big star has to get the girl. So they, literally, you know, Bollywood adaptation, there is film adaptation and there are Bollywood adaptations. And it's quite difficult to like adapt to Bollywood because there are certain rules of Bollywood which are changing slowly. But it became a big hit, so you know it's kind of nice. Uh, but over time, I got a little more clout uh, in the industry. And now the latest one that has come out, it's called Kaipoche. I, I think I'll show you a small trailer of it. This book was a very, uh, this is my third book and the last book I wrote in Hong Kong. It is on uh, you know, the aspiration of India's youth and on these youth who want, who are dreaming big, but are not able to become big. 
in fact, the trailer begins with that. They're sitting in a car, but it's not really a car. You'll see it. Um, and here, and it is about religious violence. It is about politics. It's about cricket. And here, there was a lot more book than star. And therefore, we took brand new guys. We took like basically TV actors who've never acted in a movie before and basically hopefully turned them into stars, you can say. And that movie also has just come out. That also has done very well by newcomer film standards. Of course, it, it cannot match Three Idiots because it is the highest movie and it had a very big star. But amongst newcomer films, it, it did uh, extremely well. And that, in a way, is a hope for the industry that today the book adaptations have started in India. It doesn't need a big star. Three Idiots, we didn't know whether it did really well because of the star or because of the book. But here, it's clearly the book and, of course, a very good direction uh, that made it successful. And I think, in a way, I've been lucky that I've been part of that from starting in Starbucks. I've been part of this change in uh, Bollywood, as we call it, or Indian film industry. Um, and that has been the journey so far. So, I, and I, I hope book adaptations continue because otherwise, what will I do? I can't act. I can't sing in our movies. <laughs> but if we can just have the trailer for Kaipoche, Kaipoche is a regional English, uh, regional Indian word. Uh, you know, it's like screaming gotcha. It's like screaming when in a kite competition, when, when someone's kite is cut, they say that. That's what the name means. Uh, the promo has not got that many dialogues. But initially, these boys are talking about how they will become big in life, but they, they can't. And um, maybe you'll just see the promo, you'll enjoy the colors of India, if nothing else. Okay, so yeah. can we play that clip, please? You became a politician, so you should do so much. I'll give you the name of the sports academy. Hey, friends, give attention to the road and give the car a car. One, two, three, go! Like since he was born. <laughs> Thank you, and I think we'll hear next from Michael Tolkien, esteemed novelist and filmmaker from Los Angeles. Um, can you hear me good? Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Um, it's my first trip to Hong Kong, and I'm, it's very exciting. And I'm, uh, I'm not too jet lagged, so I don't think I'm going to fall asleep while I'm talking. Um, I've adapted, I've written four novels, and I've adapted one of them, which became a movie called The Player, which has had some success. Um, and this question of 
adaptations is is at least in Hollywood right now is a it's a very big issue because the studios right now don't like the idea of original projects. They're afraid of something that's an original screenplay because it doesn't have any background. Um, they're really looking for properties that have uh, that have that have succeeded in another form, which is why the people who own Marvel Comics are now billionaires. Um, that's why the studios are looking through their backlogs. They're looking through. They want to make do remakes. Uh, anything that has a proven story that that has been developed in another form, because movies are so expensive. One of the things that they're looking to do is 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 uh, you know what they call tent poles, which is a, a movie that supports everything they everything they've got. And so a movie that can be if they can make one movie turn into two movies, turn into three, turn into five, they have a better chance of, of, of making a lot of money. And to some degree they've been proven right, which is that the most successful movies, a lot of the most successful movies are adaptations. Uh, where, the adapta where the material comes from is also interesting. Um, I don't know, the television series Dexter, the producer walked into a bookstore, saw a book sitting on the counter, picked it up, looked at the, sort of flipped through it, said this is interesting, and turned it into an immense property. When Alan Ball, who created the series Wise Blood, was in an airport, he was looking for something to read, pulled Wise Blood off the shelf, and uh, it developed it into a series. Um, people are just looking, people are looking for material all the time. The question then is, what, what kind of stories are loan themselves to being turned into movies? And my perspective is interesting because I've written four novels and, only, and I've only allowed one of them to be turned into a film because I thought that the others really weren't movies and, didn't, and, and, and shouldn't be filmed. Um, this search for material that connects is not necessarily a search for a movie, for a book that's a bestseller, um, but for something that has an emotional an emotional, a sense of emotional completion that uh, sometimes a novel, it, it, it's better developed in a novel than in, in, as, a, as, a, as a screenplay because when you're writing a novel or when you're reading a novel there's an immense wealth of, of detail about the characters, emotional and psychological and, and that psychological exploration and depth can be translated in, into a film. Um, so the search, I mean, every producer that I know is constantly looking for material, constantly reading unpu unpublished books, manuscript, who's, you know, the, the, the biggest producers get the first look at the, at the most compelling books. They don't, everything gets, doesn't get turned into a, into a movie, but the search right now is on for pre-existing material. Okay, thank you. Interesting. Uh, we're going to go next to Stu from Tokyo Pop. Thank you, Wendy. Um, so, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for attending our panel. Um, just we're briefly introducing ourselves here. So, my background is, um, I think, a little bit unique in the sense that I've been involved both on the book publishing side of the business and the film production side of the business. And um, in terms of actually creating films, too, I've done a bit of writing. Um, nothing to the pedigree of Michael, of course. Um, but I've dealt with adapting on my own creatively and as a producer with other writers who have adapted and also dealing with directors who are directing an adaptation as well as directing a bit myself an adaptation and dealing with the major studio who is Sony Pictures who produced and paid for and produced a film named Priest two years ago that was based off of the graphic novel that we published. Um, that originated from Korea, actually. So that project involves Asia, it involves a Hollywood adaptation, it involves a lot of writing challenges, and um, ultimately a large budget production which deviated quite significantly from the source material, and, and quite a lot of lessons learned in that case, too. So basically I've been involved in, in these different elements of adapting for the big screen and for the small screen, um, I originally, a little bit more about my background, um, my company, I founded a company named Tokyo Pop, which brought Japanese graphic novels, Japanese manga, 
to the West, to America, and we've published many, many titles, including Sailor Moon, if you're familiar with that, Gundam, some large titles, as well as unknown titles and original titles that we created in partnership with a number of, of authors. And of that group, I have about 10 projects right now I'm producing um, from that intellectual property, and we're adapting a couple projects in Australia, um, a project in Korea, a project, yeah, and a few projects in the States, including one at Disney right now. So basically a whole range. Um, so depending on where our conversation goes today, I can speak to different aspects of it. But the one thing to know, while it's wonderful to have source material, there are significant challenges that come with the advantage and the burden of source material. So dealing with those and navigating those challenges as a producer is quite hard, as well as as a writer and a director. So I don't know if we can prep a clip. I, I was sort of seeing if it was possible. But if we are able to get online and go to YouTube, you can watch the trailer of Priest. Um, I don't know. Somewhere, someone out there in the AV department? No, we cannot. OK, so when you get a chance, if you'd like, on your phones maybe right now, you can not all now, go. later. Later. <laughs> later. Not now. We can't. We want people to pay attention. We can't. That's happen. right. That's yeah. right. We'll all be quiet for yeah. two minutes when we watch. <laughs> if if you want to look up this film called Priest, starring Paul Bettany, you can watch the trailer. It was a seventy million dollar film at Sony, so quite a big budget and uh, action movie. And as I mentioned, a lot of things were changed during the adaptation, and so we can speak a bit more about that later if you like. So that's a simple introduction. Okay. Thank you. And Marisha, please. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming here today. Um, so briefly, just to um, introduce myself, I'm a, a literary agent here in Hong Kong. Um, so I, up until probably the last few years, I've been de dealing primarily with um, Asian literature, particularly Chinese literature. Um, the reason for that is I have a background in Chinese. I studied Chinese at university years ago, um, hence my fascination with China. So I have many Chinese authors I represent, probably the top tier of Chinese authors today. Uh, I've also lived in Hong Kong for 15 years, hence I've, I have, I feel, a, a background here. Um, so that's a little bit about Peony. Um, What's been very interesting, I've been running Peony Literary Agency for the last eight years or so, or I've been agenting here. And then the last couple of years, probably two, three years, there's been much, much more interest in um, China stories, uh, where the US studios are, are coming to me looking for bilingual screenplay writers. Uh, so it's been interesting watching what's been going on in the market, particularly in China. Um, hence, um, I ended up uh, working uh, on a book called The Flowers of War. Now, actually, I was going to interrupt. I don't know if we can play that clip, because I did send the clip to Sharon and then decided not to show it. <laughs> I don't want to overcomplicate it. might just be good Do to Do we have a Flowers it. of War clip or no? Uh, no? No. It is, yeah, it's on Watch YouTube. that afterwards <laughs> as well, yeah. <laughs> okay, so perhaps we won't screen it. So anyway, The Flowers of War. Um, it was a very interesting experience. I don't know if I'll, I'll talk about it now, or perhaps we can sort of talk about it later. I think oh, go yes, ahead and maybe you. talk about it a, a little bit now, if you can. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> this, this is the British edition of uh, the book, without the film tie-in version. And I've brought here, actually, various translation. That, that is the US, thank you, <laughs> US edition, which is the film tie-in version. And then we have the German edition, um, here, um, and that is, I think, the Italian edition, <laughs> and that's the Spanish edition. Um, so this is all, this is, it's unusual in some ways to have something in Chinese literature that's traveled so well, and the film was something that very much helped. The, the experience was also a very interesting one, um, because um, I sold these rights off the treatment which was in English. Ordinarily, if I'm selling something in translation, um, I would have it in Chinese with a sample in English. So there, it was actually got a little bit confusing because um, then 
the book that was published was quite different to the treatment. So <laughs> it, the, the whole experience was actually very interesting. And then coordinating with the film studios to get the posters and the artwork. Um, so just to backtrack a little bit, the film is directed by Zhang Yimou. So it had a purely Chinese and Japanese cast with one Western actor, Christian Bale which I think is something quite new in um, the Chinese, in the film industry, where you've got a combination of East and West in a story. Um, so again, it was very interesting seeing how trying to make that story work um, for an international audience. Um, there were a lot of teething problems with it, and we won't see, if you can see it on YouTube, I think it'll give you an idea of the story. But I think, I, I think this is probably the beginning of these kinds of corporations. I think it's still very early um, in the industry, uh, as there's increasing interest. But as Stu said earlier, there are many challenges in working on these projects, um, which perhaps we can speak about later. Uh, these adaptations and where you've got different cultures involved. Um, so I think, yes, perhaps we can come back to that yeah. later when we speak. Yeah, well, I wanted to go ahead and, and speak a little bit about Flowers of War. You know, having this Christian Bale character was probably one reason it was able to get financed the way it was, having this sort of Western character in a Chinese story. And you've also got something like Keanu Reeves working on Man of Tai Chi now. Mm -hmm that he's starring in as well, so it's sellable to the West as well. How important is that? Or are we going to soon see Chinese international films that don't have a Western character to hook those audiences? Well, I think, potentially, I think there will be a continuation of trying to get a Western actor in a natural way into Chinese films. Because if you think about it, most of the Chinese films that have had international distribution have been purely Chinese. I sort of think off the top of my head, um, Su Tong's Raise the Red Lantern, um, or um, Moyen's Red Sorghum, or Yu Hua's uh, To Live. Um, and I think the audience has been probably very, very niche. So having someone, I mean, unfortunately, to, to kind of try and bring together all those cultures, I think is perhaps the way to go. But it's making the story work within that context, which is not easy because you're blending those two characters. But I think there may be more of these types of films. And I know there are discussions. Personally, you know, there are discussions going on. So, um, yes, I think it's the beginning. It is the beginning. Can I jump, yeah. I want to jump in and, and mention that? Um, ironically, the, my next project that I'm working on right now um, will be doing something pretty unique in picking a, an Asian star to be the lead role, a male star to be the lead role in a film that is more or less a Hollywood film. So the other actors will all be Western. Um, the, the female lead will be Western. Um, some of the supporting characters will be Western but the male lead and the male lead's brother character will be Asian. And it looks like we just cast our lead, although I can't say who it is yet. Um, very, very well-known actor. And um, it should be pretty exciting. We're also planning on filming in Asia um, and doing visual effects work in Asia too, although it will be a global film, a Hollywood film, all in English. So, so mixing these these elements and finding that sort of magical um, formula that can cross over into both markets is something I think we're all challenging, but, but thinking out of the box and trying new ways, uh, I think, is critical. Interesting. Yeah. How did Flowers of War do internationally? Um, not particularly well. It right. hasn't actually had a lot of international distribution. There was a limited release of the, uh, I mean, I, I think part of that is, is I think it's maybe ended up not one thing or the other. It's neither a, a beautiful Chinese story nor a Western story. And I think that you're going to have that with these stories. Right. Um, so it's, it's had some um, distribution in the US and the UK no, and Spain. It. Yeah, Spain right. most recently. And that's where it's at at the moment. And was the book an international success? Yes, it's done very well. It's in the sense of, in fo it's an interesting question. You say, has it done very well? With works in uh, translation from China, um, where we're at at the moment, the market is quite small. Um, it's 
more in sales of translation rights. That's where um, it sits. As far as hard sales for works uh, from China, it's not really there. There are no huge sellers in translation as yet. Right. The thing we're not talking about, the, the, it's funny, we have, no one has mentioned The Life of Pi, which is really the, I mean, I think that that's, from Hollywood's point of view, that's the most interesting development in, in cinema in years, which is a book not written by an American with a, an, an Indian central figure, issues that are not particularly American, but it was proven as an international success, well, 20 million copies around the world. So the strength of the, of the world's reception to the book gave them the, the courage to make the movie as they did, and it succeeded internationally. Yeah, that, that was a huge risk and a huge struggle. It took the studio years, and then they, they changed directors a bunch of times. They went and they, they redid the screenplay. I mean, it, it really was a struggle for them to get to where they... But every were. movie's a struggle. Yeah. I mean, True. every movie, every, every movie, True. every single movie is a movie that nobody wanted to make. <laughs> but what, what, what do you think made that story successful internationally? What is it in that story? It that's... was it it, it 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 was the Wizard of Oz. It's Dorothy going through the storm and having her magical companions. It was the fantasy. Oh, I'd like to be alone on a boat with a tiger that I control. I mean, and I'm not belittle. Well, I am belittling it. Um, uh, I, I, um, but. No, not not believe, but I mean, it was it was there was a simplicity to it. It was a it was a cartoon. But but there's spiritual elements that I think also resonated with right. a lot of the readers. Right, and the spiritual side, yes, that that I think, yes, and actually that's not a small part. I think that the that what was, what might have been different in Flowers of of War was that if they'd concentrated more on the spiritual development, of the two communities and his spiritual growth and spent less time showing bloody bodies. Yeah. I think that it was, point, a, yeah. I think that there the problem with the film was that it was really hard to, he spent so much time recreating the city. This, I don't know if you saw the movie, it's, it's one of the greatest sets ever built. It was a, but it was a complete universe, but it was too violent for what it needed to be so that you felt a connection with the girls and the whores. Yes, that's a very interesting point. I think there's another, actually, book to film, which was an Indian um, novel, which was originally, I think, published under Q&A by Vika Swarup, which was then turned into Slumdog, Slumdog. Millionaire, Millionaires. Um, and that did phenomenally well. And again, why did that story work? Um, but, but in both Life of Pi and Slumdog Millionaire, what you're talking about are incredibly brilliant filmmakers you know, incredibly brilliant filmmakers with a point and the ability to have the support of their studios and their financiers to tell the story that they think it should be on the screen. And that's not, I mean, finding a filmmaker like that isn't easy. Yeah, it's taking risks, I think, a lot of those. The financiers are taking risks on a filmmaker's vision sometimes. Right, if you take away nothing from this panel except be a genius, <laughs> Just be a genius. Be a genius. It really solves most or, of your problems. Or find a genius that you or, can produce. Right, find a genius and exploit him. Yeah. That's the other, yeah. that's I wanted the other to, path. I wanted to move to Shaitan and ask, you know, you came from an investment banking background, so you knew the finance world. You then became a novelist. And then I assume the film world was pretty new to you. And your, just your experience and what you thought was going to happen to your book when it was made into a film and what the reality was when that actually happened? Yeah. You know, actually the investment banking experience came very useful in films because anybody who's been in the film business knows there is more backstabbing in the film business than anywhere else. And it's like you see, what you see on screen is so beautiful, love stories, amazement, but behind the scenes there is so much politics there is so much backstabbing. He, he wrote an entire uh, novel and screenplay yeah. about it. Yeah, the player. Know, the, yes, the, the, so, uh, film on films. Uh, but uh, it's. And the department I was in in investment banking was the distressed debt department, where, where you have to recover money from people who don't want to pay the bank. So, it also brings out the worst side of humanity. And I think 
just dealing with people, dealing with tough people, tough negotiations, um, because it's still new in India. You know, the concept of giving proper credit to the author is new in India. So I had a fight on that. The concept of doing contracts is new in India, in the film industry. And I came from a banking world where everything is contractual, you're only reading legal documents. So it was beneficial that because I was in the distress debt, we checked 20 things to be on our guard. Like it's called negative pledges and all those things. And I would sit in a meeting and I'll say, but what if this happens? What if this happens? You know, um, what if a force majeure happens? And they're like, what's going on? What are you talking about? You're a, aren't you an artist? Aren't you a novelist? But I was like, you know what? I, this is the way we have protected ourselves. So I think one is that was very helpful. And the second is like, he said, if films are expensive, it is an art form, but imagine it to be like a painter with very, very expensive brushes and very, very expensive canvases. So even if you're the most brilliant painter in the world, if you're buying very expensive brushes and very expensive canvases, your painting at least has to recover the cost of the brush or nobody's going to let you paint anymore. So, you know, and that is something which is not there in books. You literally can type away or write away and technically there's very little input cost in a book compared to a movie where there is people's time, money and all, I think that helped me a little bit. It also earned me a little bit of a criticism from the traditional literary circles that here comes the sellout, you know, and the fact that he is, he's so particular about, um, so when, for example, Kai Poche was being made, the, it had new actors. I knew that this film cannot be that expensive. So anybody who tried to make it into another three idiots would become an idiot yeah. because it's not going to make that kind of money. So you can't make it with that much budget as they made three idiots. So if three idiots budget was say $12 million uh, production budget, this was at $2 million. And then three idiots made whatever 30, 40 million and this made eight, nine million and this also is a hit. So all those things, I mean, it's not like you need to be a banker for it, it's basic common sense. But just the way you think, I think it helps a lot. And I think Hong Kong, living in Hong Kong teaches you a lot about money. It's all about money, right? So uh, in that sense, people found it easier to work with me in some ways, at least the producer. Like the producer would be telling me, please tell this director, he's spending so much on this. Please talk to him. Normally it's the authors who go and say, no, no, it has to be done like this. It has to be artistic. But they would come to me, you understand, you understand you know, what the interest rate bank is charging me. Please explain to the director. So it, it helps a little bit. I, I don't know, I may have a job in production later on, although <laughs> it's, it's, a very, um, it's a very thankless kind of field. There's a producer here, but I think it's, it's very tough. So yeah, it's a different, it's business and art mixed. And in, in some may call it impure, but that's the nature of the business. It's art and business mixed together, which some like and some don't. Yeah. Michael, I would love to hear your... Even the Sistine Chapel was art and business. You know, they hired Michelangelo, he said, I want to do this. No, 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 put the Pope over here. I mean, it's, it's like everything, everything narrative, everything narrative that involves imagery and a lot of money to get the imagery together involves a comp, not comp, I hate the word compromise. It's a really wrong, it's a bad word. Involves a, what? Collaboration. Involves collaboration or just involves balance. It involves, it involves uh, sort of checking and correcting and, and you know, um, uh, again, that's what's interesting about, about starting with a novel is that a novel, one of the things about a novel is that, is that it's the, it starts with one vision in, purely as itself and then, and then other people come in and start seeing something so that, as you said, things will change or, you know, and sometimes those changes are for the good and frankly, sometimes those changes are really dreadful and kill the thing that, and kill the thing that's, that's special. It's interesting, I, I, I don't know, how many of you read, read any Patricia Highsmith novels? Just before I go off into a... All right, so I'm gonna speak to the three people in this, in this room who've read Patricia Highsmith. Patricia Highsmith, she wrote Strangers on a Train, the Rip talented Mr. Ripley. So she wrote, she's an incredible writer, and I think she wrote about 20 novels, and all of them have been turned into, almost all of them have been turned into movies. But, and I've seen most of them, 
And what's interesting is that the thing that makes the book special, the really perverse, twisted, kinky, surprising element, usually having to do with the end, is thrown out. Like, in, in her books, and I followed this in the player, the killers often get away with murder, or there's, there's an unre something's unresolved. So what gets bought and turned into the movies is, is a very neat little idea. It's like Philip K. Dick. Philip K. Dick's, you know, Blade Runner was based on Philip K. Dick. Minority Report was based on Philip K. Dick. Scanner Darkly is based on Philip K. Dick. And not a single movie made from a Philip K. Dick novel really represents the story and the characters and the ending. What they buy and what's, worth, what's, what's useful, like in, in Minority Report, what they bought was there are people who can tell the future and, and a police force is based on, a, on, on stopping crimes and, that, and, and, and killing people who have not yet commi committed their crimes. The, what they did with the movie was they took that f in a much m different direction than, than, than is in the book, but sometimes it's just the germ of an idea. It is, it's the situation, and the situation is enough to provoke uh, uh, an idea which then generates something else. When I did the player, I, I, the, the movies, people would say, you know, uh, you, you change the, the, you know, you, you, you change the book, and I'd say, you know, the, I, I didn't adapt the book. There's a better way of looking at it, which is that there is a story. I, in one version of that story, I made a book, in another version of that story, I made the movie, but it's not necessary that the, it isn't necessary to say that the book was the original version. That original idea is something that's, that's in the air. I don't want to get really religious, but, but if these things exist in a kind of pure zone from which you're inspired and you draw, for the form in which you're working, you draw the, the things that you need for that form. I noticed you, at the beginning, you said that you'd only let some of your novels be adapted to film. Are you protecting the integrity of the novel, or you don't think they're filmic, or it's I'm not been the right situation? Yeah, I'm protecting, I, I think I'm protecting my integrity. I'm protecting, I'm trying to protect something for myself as an artist. That, that I, I think that there's, that there are great things about movies and great things about television, but there are also great things about books. And I think that when you start writing a book with the movie in mind, you're betraying yourself because what makes a book great, if you're a book reader, is, is the immersion into the experience of the consciousness of the writer and it's the responsibility of that writer to provide a satisfying and, and rich experience of his or her consciousness and delivering you to a conclusion of emotion, but that's not necessarily the conclusion of an action. And a movie is much more the con conclusion, an emotional conclusion to an action. And a book is not necessarily ending with a particular action. It can end with a, a moral conclusion. You're saying that effectively the two should kind of complement each other, the book and the film, um, not personally with your, with your um, own writing, even though they are actually two different entities. Um, but they should in some ways complement each other. Uh, that they should complement each yes, other? Well, I'm, I'm saying that they don't have to complement each other, actually. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that the, you, can, you can fairly end, uh, you can, if you've got a story, uh, someone commit, somebody commits a murder because he thinks he's killing, he's not sure who he's, somebody, uh, the, the basic idea of the player is uh, 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 an executive is being threatened by a writer, he doesn't know who the writer is, so he kills a writer who he thinks might be the writer, but he, was, it's not the, he didn't kill the right person. So. If you abstract that idea and you see, take away the studio, you take away the Hollywood, and you say, someone wants to kill me, I'm gonna subst I will kill someone. Just kill someone in hopes of stopping that killer. Then uh, it doesn't, uh, that's outside of the context. And if you take the, that idea away from the context and you put it into a new context, then the new context may open up a different possibility or a different, a different way of, of experiencing it, which is valid for that context. 
That's interesting. Then, then you come back to potentially having very talented screenplay writers, which I think is something that is maybe missing in China. Bilingual screenplay writers, where you you have that concept, as you're saying, of the story、uh, and making it work, but then having someone who can read, say,、uh, we're talking about Chinese now, Chinese and English, and be able to write that story. And I think that's something that maybe at this stage of the industry missing, because I, I know I. Uh, 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 no. Well, no, I don't. I know this. I mean, I, I, I'm on the、uh, in the Academy Motion Picture Academy, and I'm on the executive committee that selects the foreign language Oscars. And we, there's 65 movies. Each, we got 60. I think we got 65 countries submitting films this year, and I saw about 40 of the of the films. And I think there's an awful lot of really great screenwriting out in the world. I mean, I don't know that we're. I, I think that things have changed.、Um, I mean, I, I think that there's. You know, I, I, last night I just、uh, was at the、um, Asian Film Awards last night, and I saw the first、uh, prize was given. There were five nominated films, and the the first prize given was for the screenplay for a Chinese film called Mystery. And I saw the clip, and the clip was brilliant. And then I saw the other clips, and I knew it was going to win Best Picture. I was like, that was such a stunningly original vision that I, I knew it was going to win. And it was a writer director, so there's that's a, there's the answer. I think the I think that the this crippling paradigm of Joseph Campbell's Journey of the Hero, I think that that's been for good and bad. That's been absorbed by every screenwriter in the world, and there's a million books about it, and they all tell the same story. And everybody's seen Star Wars, and everybody knows you've got to have the confrontation with the father, and everybody knows you have to have your three friends along the way, and you you know it's like.、Uh, All right, and maybe that form is breaking down a little bit, which would be great. But I,、I'm, I don't think God wants that form destroyed yet. So we're going to have to be stuck with it for a while.、Um, question then for Stu and Marisha: Do you think people are looking for the same kind of formulas to option, or exciting, or completely original new voices? Are they breaking through in book to screen? I, you know, it's it's. I'm fascinated just. First of all, listening to this panel, you know, hearing, hearing、uh, Michael is is clearly、um, really has some some I don't know just really great insight on the process overall. My my experience is is I think a little bit different because things come from graphic novels, and、um, I, I think in general there is a desire on the part of the studios that we work with. To have a structure that they're used to, that they believe is sort of the essence of storytelling, right or wrong, that the structure is something that they can grasp and they can see how an audience will react throughout an hour and a half, and yeah, they're they're pretty nervous about going anywhere far outside of that box, and so to do that, you do need, I think, foreign films, and you do need independently financed films, and you need to have somebody on, you know. Pick up a, an iPhone and do something crazy for for an hour, and you know, to change it. All right. So,、uh, think of the screenplay as 92 pounds and kind of weak, and think of the studio as a football team, and all they do is pound the shit out of that 92 pounder, and if he can, they just keep pounding and pounding and pounding, and say, get up. And they pound it against it. Get up! If it can keep standing, and still look sort of like what it was at the beginning of the fight, they say, "Well, hey, it's tough. All right, maybe we can make this movie." And I think so that there's this process of beating a story up and beating and examining it. And it, I don't think. I mean, I don't think it's they're it's hateful, but I don't think they're completely wrong. Slightly. Going on from what you're saying,、um, to answer the question, are you know people wanting more of the same? I mean, that's what I get with the Chin- with Chinese literature. They want a, a crime thriller. They want a legal thriller. They want a genre that sort of exists、um, in. Every th- I mean, Shakespeare said, "Give them what they want." They want a revenge <laughs> play. Ah,、oh, they want to have like a bunch of fairies out in the forest at night. You know, star-crossed lovers. People. He was he was shameless. He took all. He, everything he did was an adaptation. He died.、Oh, it's an old story. I don't have to think up something new now. 
It's a, you know, and I, that's seriously, you know, I think that, that, that he was, he took basically great stories, added this thing that he had, but he took stories that were, that were, that were initially really powerful. And he took the genres, and I, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm all for genre. I think everything is genre in way, one way or another. Well, one of the things I think I think we haven't really spoken that much about yet so far are the characters themselves. I mean, it seems to me that that for most films that work, it's because there's a character that that really steps up beyond an average character, and building that character's voice is a lot in the screenplay itself, and then of course how that's shown visually. But but without a powerful character, I think most films end up dying, and so. Do you think the approach to character... Now, we're all asking Michael questions. <laughs> you know, do you, do you, I'm curious if any of you guys think the approach to character in a novel is different than the approach to character in a screenplay. No, but I was listening to... Chad, so, I, was just, I haven't read your books. I haven't seen your movies. I'm the only one, apparently. <laughs> and, 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 but what was interesting was you were just talking about characters. You weren't talking about a situation. You were talking about people. And everything starts with that. Yeah, I mean, there is this whole um, concept of a star in movies, in commercial movies. And uh, in, in books also you need strong characters, but those strong characters can be, um, they don't have to be the star characters. In the sense you can have a strong character who's a 90 year old man. Now, that doesn't work very well for a movie usually. Exceptions don't prove the rule. Life the Pie is not the normal model people should work on. If you read all interviews of the studio on Life of Pi, they basically admitted it was a passion project. They said, we don't expect to make money out of it. I don't know why we did it. We just did it. Because we thought maybe we'll break even someday. It just turns out it was very, very, very beautiful and a lot of it is to do with Angley and all. But that's not how they can come to work saying, let's make three more Life of Pi's, $120 million movies with 18-year-old unknown Indian kids. I mean, it's not going to happen. So, largely movies are based around sellable stars and those stars a, take a lot of the limelight in a movie, especially in Bollywood movies. That guy will say all the cool lines. He can pick up any girl, he can dance the best, he can beat 20 people. Now, f for Bollywood, that is a strong character. But for a novelist, that, that's a unrealistic, it's boring, it's stupid. Um, and for a novelist, maybe a, somebody with a mental illness is a strong character or somebody like somebody who's a drunk and or any 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 very flawed characters can also be very strong characters whereas in a movie at least in india movies are seen as escapism a lot of poor people in india of course and a lot of poor people who watch movies are really not looking at a reflection of their own lives whereas in the us people want to see a, like they'll see an american beauty they'll see a movie which tells them how they are and it's and it's changing in India also, like Kai Poche is a more about Indian middle class, how it is. It's not as the hero is not jumping off a helicopter or things like that. But a large section of India still wants to see that. And they will want scripts like that. I mean, if I go with a beautifully written Eternal Sunshine or even an American Beauty, like an Indian version of it, most stars would say, what have you written? I mean, it's beautiful, but I'm not going to do it. Even the star will say, I know it's very good, but I will not do it because get me a story where I'm a billionaire who falls in love with a waitress. And, you know, now we're talking. Yeah. <laughs> you know, now that's a strong character to them. So it is, I guess it comes down to pandering a little bit. And I think movie makers, unfortunately, like he said, he made anything, give them what they want. It's the pandering happens more in the movie business. Novels can also pander, but it's less because the pressure to pander to the audience is less. You, a novelist can say, you know what, I'll tell you this story. And it's okay, I can take that chance. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, I'll do it another time. In a movie, your career is over. If you do it wrong, your career can be finished in one movie. No, he's that guy who lost that much money in that movie. Who cares what story you wrote? So that is, I think, the big difference in character. You do need strong characters. In good movies, you need strong characters who are good in a novel also. But you can, it's a little different, at least in India. That bridge is coming where people realize and even the stars realize. And we need to make more successful films with 
uh, with heroes in unconventional roles. But that, That's that, the only way they listen. They'll not listen if I make a case or a, they will listen if they see a movie about, you know, three poor kids doing very successfully at the box office. Then they'll be like, okay, give me that, you know. So it is, it's a very insecure field I found. I don't know, I, I'm still new to it. I found the movie industry is one of the most insecure places. Everybody is trying to be part of a project that will, uh, that has other people who are successful. So I am on this successful team, so my career will go further. But deep down, everybody is insecure. And in fact, that itself is the most fascinating part I find as a novelist. But I think that, that, that will change all these, in panel discussions, they'll talk of character and all that. But then they go down to their office and they're like, no, wait, yeah, this won't sell. Come on, I mean, you know, make him do something more. It's so many times, they, I mean, yesterday, my uh, one screenplay I'm working on, and it's, he said in the meeting, yeah, it's really nice, everything. And then yesterday he called, you know what? Give him more over-the-top humor. That sells. You know, give him this, give him this. And I was just tearing my hair out that at some point you got to stop. You know, I know I'm prostituting myself, but don't make me do so many things, you know. Even a prostitute is a human being, right? So, <laughs> just, so it's a bit of that. I get that feeling sometimes. This hair is gone, this hair is gone, <laughs> no. and that hair is gone. So I know it. I know it. I, it's, um, it, 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 yes, there's a certain obtuse stupidity that you have to deal with. And it is stupidity. Yeah, and it's, I like that 92 pound and football team analogy. But it, it, it's more like a gang rape, actually. Where your soul is, all, it's not just you're beaten now up. You see, he just soul. rewrote me. <laughs> Adaptation. And it's good. No, it's good. He, I said, I started with a fight and he added a rape. Yeah. They was right. The studio said, it's got to be sexy. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's more, I think that's more relevant to India right now as a topic anyway. So. Yeah, actually, you can't make this joke in India right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right. it's a, it right. is, yeah, but I mean, I'm just saying, I don't mean in that way, but I think there is, it's not just that they beat you up by their power or their might of commercial. They sometimes do make you question your, uh, you know, you as an artist and you, you start wondering, what am I really doing? I, I, I'm working on one screenplay, which is the first pure screenplay I'm working on. Um, and I did it because it's a big movie, but now I'm, I really feel I want to escape to my world of pen and paper books because this is just too much. But then, but then you f feel like in India, most people don't read. So if I want to tell my stories, I have to embrace this medium of movies, especially when it's come to me easily. So it is, I, and I would like to know from the panelists here, how do they, I don't know if that is so much there abroad or not, but for me, movies are important to reach Indians because they, that's what they consume. I mean, it's, it's life and blood for Indians, movies and cricket. So if I don't embrace that medium, it's, it's going to be difficult. But at the same time, this, 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 it's not compromise, but it's the, the commercial aspects of it dominates so much that other art forms just come across as more beautiful. You know, just like, because movies are about money and it's a lot of money at stake. Can I just sort of backtrack just briefly, briefly, because you mentioned strong characters. I mean, my question is, you know, is a strong, cult a strong character in one culture the same as in another culture? Because if I think to say the classic um, construction, I'm sort of going into detail here, of a Chinese novel, it's not constructed in the same way generally as a Western novel. It's much more first-person narrative. Um, there aren't as many digressions. It's fairly linear. Um, and I don't know whether that's something that is an issue, but yes, the question is, a strong character, what is that? I, I think in, in what I've seen in, in Japan, because my experience is more with Japan, is that while the storytelling methodology and approach is certainly different than in the West, the, the level of the character's presence, the character's aura, the character's struggles, the character's unwillingness to do things that are thrust upon them and then the way that they react to that are all they're all there in both cases um, I don't think in either case you have a truly passive character that ends up winning over an audience the way that the action occurs may be different and the plot approaches may be different but the characters struggles and the character overcoming those struggles at least I've seen are pretty consistent as sort of abstract approaches I, I, this is, I don't know, this may answer your question a little bit, but I, I, I've noticed 
it's a theory. I don't know. It's a, over the years, because I've been looking at movies, my father was Russian and liked going to foreign movies. So from the time I was 10, I was going to the art house theaters. And I mean, I saw La Dolce Vita when I was 11 years old and loved it. Um, and was watching Truffaut and Godard when I was a kid. And I think that most national cinemas have a period of a, of a flower, and, and I think this answers the question about character and, and, and the courage of the storytelling. When an economy of a country expands enough so that the people have the capacity to look at themselves and question themselves, post-war Italian cinema, which attacked the rising bourgeoisie, the same thing in, 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 in Germany when Fassbinder and, and, and came up. The same thing in Spain when Amadovar came up. Uh, the same thing in Korea, because uh, I'm a huge fan of Korean movies, and you see over the last 15 years how the Korean cinema has become so important. And this is true for Chinese cinema now, as we're seeing it. Japanese, absolutely, you know, uh, after the war. So there's a period when the movies and the audience have the ability to look at themselves and aren't afraid of themselves. Now, there's still silly comedies and romantic comedies that, you know, that make the money, but that there's a core of something going on that people aspire to. That changes, and there's a point at which that's no longer true, and I think that's when the storytelling and the characters become more decadent, and that's when the money that pays for the, the, the movies becomes more afraid, and that's when you run into trouble. And you, and you say, but, you know, this filmmaker was given the freedom to make his movie, and they say, yeah, but it didn't do that well, or nobody wants that anymore. And when you hear that phrase, they don't want that anymore, then you have to, as an artist, then, and it's very, very, it's really difficult. Then as an artist, you have to find a way to sneak into what you want to get done, the thing that's important to you, while having the stupid happy ending. Right, we, we talk about layering it. I mean, that's something yeah. we talk about all the time in development meetings. It's like, yeah, this is the theme we want. This is the message that we have. This is the artistic vision we have. Well, let's bury it deep enough so that nobody notices. You know, we yeah. have to sneak it in. I think it's, no, it's but exactly... On a practical level, I mean, it's, I can see that happen in India. In fact, the fact that I'm sitting here and the fact that somebody took a novel and made a movie, it's, it's happening... A, the top Indian movie today, uh, it's like a $25 million box office in India would be considered a very big hit. You cannot make a very artistic movie with that kind of a box office expectation required to break even. But you could get 5 to $10 million today on a very well-made film. So as long as you make the film for 2 $3 million, it's okay. Whereas if it's a running around trees movie, as the old world Bollywood call it, with a big star, you can still make it for 10, 15 million dollars. So I cannot get 10, 15 million dollars to tell a very artistic story of a very, uh, it will just not fly. And, but there are people out there who will fund two, three million dollars movies with the hope of making six, seven. And I think it's a start. Like if you pitch a Life of Pi, which was an Indian character, if you think about it, if you pitch Life of Pi to Indian studios, they'll, to me, it's a very strong character who never gives up, who keeps facing the odds etc, etc, and it's Indian, that Pai Patel. But most people in the meeting, I can, I can imagine, they'll say, no love story? <laughs> and you keep telling them that he'll go through this and magic, and, and in the end of the meeting, again they'll say, but no love story? Can we put a girl, another girl in a boat on, you know, <laughs> maybe then, and, and now, now, that's where the question comes. If, if Pai was to be in a boat with another girl and a tiger, I don't know. I mean, yes, you can do a story, but it kills the whole concept of the tiger and the boy, right? It's all about how, does he get the girl or not, and it becomes like the Blue Lagoon or something, It'll, you know, <laughs> which is fine. Yeah. But uh, that's part two. That, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Pie and the irrational. <laughs> um, yeah. So those, but it is happening, and like. And I think that three million movies which make five million is because there's a sizable Indian society now which is affluent enough that they want movies that give them insights on themselves. They are finding escapist cinema boring and there are enough theatres for them. It's, a, it's called the multiplex versus single screens in India where in the big cities you have these nice theatres like you have in Hong Kong where movies tickets are much higher priced 
So even though fewer people go, the average box office is three times that of a normal theater. So there are these equations forming. I'm waiting for the day when these movies actually take over. And then escapist cinema, the musicals go away. Like it's understood that every Indian movie will have songs. And like this, Kai which had no lip, it has some music, but it has two minute songs and all montage pieces, no lip sync songs. Whereas it's perfectly normal in an Indian movie that people start singing. I mean, to a Westerner or even here, it feels like what, what the hell's going on? <laughs> but to an Indian viewer, the, the suspension of disbelief continues through the song. And it's very hard to kind of have a movie without it because then the marketing suffers. I mean, it's not like these guys are corrupted souls. Even if you make a life of Pi, the biggest challenge is it's a very strong character. How do you market it? The reason you need a star is why? Because you put his picture on the ad and people are going to buy the ticket and walk into the theater. Right? When you put an unknown guy, they're like, why should I watch? There are so many unknown movies, they are usually bad. So that all needs to change and I, I think that evolution is coming. Society needs to change, people need to change and some risky bets need to be taken. It's that five risky movies that come and they just redefine cinema for the next five years, I think. And I think that, that is happening in India now. Can we squeeze in a topic real quick? Uh, just I, I, I can see that the time is, is passing. Just from a practical point of view, I'm wondering, most likely this room is filled with filmmakers, of, you know, producers, producers, whatever. And so, you know, from a, the actual specifics of adapting something, maybe a couple of the things. One thing I was thinking um, is... Actually, I might let you pause you. I'm sorry to interrupt. Sure. But I found out that our amazing tech team from HKTDC has some clips your clips ready uh, so maybe we could we, show a clip of priest and then you could maybe talk about at that as part of a case study sure, sure I mean, so could we show the the priest yeah. clip first okay thanks for showing that i just thought it might be interesting to hear how a graphic novel becomes that you know a bit of that practical advice for producers that you right right so so i guess the adaptation process itself and dealing with one, finding the rights, then licensing those rights or optioning those rights, then how you take that story and adapt it and what you do with your original writer you know, or creator, how you communicate with them, do you not communicate with, th with them. Those are things, topics that I think if, if we can talk about it, it would be great a little bit. On my, in my experience, I see things changing that originally there was a view of let's not have this original writer involved in the process at all. Let's get these rights, let's make a movie, and then, you know, it's a totally different world, so let's put them aside and, and not, you know, not even communicate with them, in, in essence. And luckily, I think that's wrong. That, that's absolutely the incorrect approach. Um, the writer has insight, but how do you manage that process so that there's not too many cooks in the kitchen? That's been a challenge. I think lately I've seen that um, embracing the original writer is something that's happening more and more, but it still is, is, an, is not an easy approach. And I find every single day topics such as, do we bring the writer in on the conversation? How much do we change of their story? Hey, we don't want someone on horseback. Can they have a motorcycle instead, even though it's the late 1800s? I got an email like that this morning from the studio, literally. And now they're like, well, can it be a parallel universe? <laughs> you know, so. You, you, you sort of, I don't know, you're peeling back this onion and there can be no end. And I think going to the essence of the original story and involving the writer, to me, I think, is, is the better way to go, especially in the world of, of social media. Well, I, I don't know, particularly with the graphic novel, not so much the, the older comic book, but the <clears throat> contemporary graphic novel, the, uh, there's an artist who has thought about how to compress a story into a series of pictures with a little bit of as little dialogue possible and as much packed into the frame as possible. So why would you not want to hire that person? Well, in terms of the writer or the artist? Because the writer. They're... In terms of the writer. Well, because one of the reasons why is because there's a bias towards writers that are not screenwriters. And I think it's changing, as I mentioned, but I've definitely encountered that bias. Because I think uh, Walking Dead, the creator of Walking Dead, is very much involved in the in the in very, the writing very much of the involved. show, and that's a great example of a case where where it's changing, making other writers miserable because he's holding to the he's holding to the integrity of the idea. Uh, 
you know, on, on the ground ultimately, whether that's happening or not, I don't know. But there's always confrontations and development. Right, but I mean, he's, that. but he, it was his idea. That's right. He understands it. He's protecting it. There are other people who can maybe just, who can execute, who have to execute story development. But at the core of it, he's there keeping the religion. That's right. And, and I think it's helped it a lot. Yeah, absolutely. But I think sometimes there is a case where um, the writer doesn't want to get involved in the, the turning of the film, and I can ask... Yeah, if there's a big enough check. <laughs> yeah, pay me to go away, I think, is it? <laughs> Yeah, but no, with but your some... Asian authors, are you finding that they want to be involved not, in the not process? Not necessarily, no. I mean, in the case of, since we mentioned The Flowers of War, the writer, uh, Yang Geling, is the writer, um, and she does a lot of film work in China, primarily for the Chinese um, audience, so a lot of TV and a lot of film. And she's very, uh, very much doesn't mind if the director takes it and adapts it. But in the case of Flowers of War, she did work directly with the, with the director, in a bilingual way, and I think it was challenging, very challenging. Uh, whether she'll do that again, I don't know, but um, they're dealing with the English and the Chinese and Japanese within that context is not, not an easy thing, and it ended up really very, very different to what she originally wrote, which was 10 years ago. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I wanted, before we, I'm gonna open up to questions in just one minute, but I wanted to ask about just some very practical drilling it down. When is the best time to option a novel? Do you always have to go through an agent? I, I imagine it's different in every territory up here. Um, just practical information for producers. When do they option it before it's published? Is that usually the best way? Do you get a better price at what stage before it's a big hit? Uh, uh, well, I just, I mean, I, I think, because I see it, I mean, I'm, aware, I'm around property. I, I, it's really, I think every case is individual. If some, some books are sold in galleys before they go in print because there's enough of an interest or because the producer who wants it, because the producer who wants the book is powerful enough and credible enough so that they feel that that's the best way to go and they're going to get the, they're going to get the, the get, people get the best shot. Others uh, hold out until the book is done and they see how it's doing. I think that, that there's a, obviously there's a, it, there's a risk in waiting to see how the book does. I, I adapted a, a, a video game, and, uh, there was a bet made that the video game was gonna be successful, and I was the second writer in adapting the, the, the game. The game died, the project was dead. Um, and uh, if they had started earlier, they might have gotten the movie in production before the game came out, but they were willing to commit to a script and then the game died, and that was it. There's a few issues um, that I think everybody should, should keep in mind. One is, if you're in a very hot area in publishing to film, like, for instance, in the States, YA novels is extremely hot. Twilight Hunger Games have shown that there's so much potential that nowadays the publishers basically auction these new titles out. They have something coming up. It's a great concept. They don't even go to a galley. It's just a concept, and they auction this stuff out. On the contrary, if you're dealing with a very literary piece, for instance, that sold 2,000 copies, but there's a passionate filmmaker who wants to make it, you know, and then the, the writer is open to it, you can get, go directly to the writer and maybe even have just a shopping agreement or not even pay much of an option fee. There's extremes. But one tough area, I think, and, and I've experienced it a little bit, there is a novel that was written in the late 70s. So if you go back, chain of title can often become an issue. There was this novel... I've always thought it was a brilliant. It was never made into a film. Just this past year, I started looking into it, and I found out that Paramount bought those rights years ago, and they still have those rights. I checked in with people I know at Paramount. They started to look into it. And it was just too much work for anyone, and I don't even know Too to much this work day. for anybody to figure out how to release. Exactly, yeah. to figure even out where the rights are and how right. to right. sort of clear that up. So older properties or older books can be a little bit challenging. I think that's really where Chinese literature sits, is people, um, film companies are going back to backlist types, as much older types. There's no, at the moment, it's not really time sensitive when you negotiate these things. Um, and it is difficult to know where, where the rights sit. Um, and maybe we'll look for questions from the audience for a minute first. Does anybody have... There's a question in the second row up here, if we could get one of the microphones is coming. 
Uh, yes, here I come. Here comes the biker. It's just uh, second row on the end here, please. Yeah. yeah this is a question for the, the everybody on the panel was wondering that, you know, you've been in the street for so long and wondering, you know, any recent example that you've seen that's break down the paradigm of, you said, Joseph Campbell's or, you know, the CFO model of storytelling, Hollywood storytelling. I'm sure, sure there's like, you know, a, a lot of attempts to, to break down that uh, model, a pattern. And I was wondering, is from your point of view, is any, you know, successful, brilliant example? That's my first question. The second question is more referred to the option of rights because I had a little conversation with Michael last night. I was wondering if you do a, uh, a, a, a not necessary adaptation, a, do a, something based on nonfiction material. You may not necessarily want what's existing in a nonfiction book, but you might be interested in the author or the story not on the page but off the page. So how you go about with dealing with those rights issues? Because your story or project is purely based on what this person has inspired, you know, this nonfiction material has entails, but not necessarily, he or she holds the right of his or her own story, but not necessarily it's already written. So it's uh, optioning a life story. Yeah, yeah, exactly, thank you. So, I mean, for the latter question, I'll, I'll respond to that. I think if the work, if the work that's nonfiction is directly related to the film that you want to make and the rights are held by a different party, it's very dangerous, for instance, to license the rights from, say, the, the, the actual person itself about their life and not include that nonfiction um, version of it. it. It really depends on what you're going to put in your story. It's very, very viable to go to that person and, and license the rights if your version of the story will be different. It, it, that's really what it comes down to, is how unique your own story is going to be. Um, there's no obligation to work off of, say, a documentary that was told about an event that occurred. You don't have to work off of that documentary. You can work straight off of the event itself. So you have more flexibility if it's the case of um, nonfiction. Does that answer your question? Or? If it's based on that person's experience, you need to clear those rights of, to, to, from that person themselves, directly. If you think you're going to get sued, protect yourself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, and people won't finance it. If there is a, war, is a risk of chain of title or something, you, you're going to run into trouble. There was a question over here. Okay, yep. Right back there. Yes, hello. I, I'm a film composer which is a bit of a contrast to writers, but very much part of the storytelling process from having the good fortune to work with Johnny Toe on Election 2. And I started communicating with the dire director through music during the editing of the film, rather than being typical Hollywood process where composer is engaged at the end of the film and has very little chance to impact the filmmaking process. I, I'd like to put it to the panel, their experience in working with film composers, especially about integrating the composer in the process of production and giving them an opportunity maybe to even perhaps influence the script. I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that. Um, in terms of pure composition as opposed to um, existing songs, basically my belief as a filmmaker is the earlier the better. So the project that I mentioned has an Asian star that we're working on right now. We're in pre-production and I've communicated with our composer and my intention is to have a previs made, I wanna make a previs of the film and actually have the composing begin at that stage before we've even shot. So to me, the earlier the better, but it also comes down to workflow and time because as you know, the queuing will change if you're too early. And so rough ideas, general feel, um, creative brainstorming, I, I think music is so integral that the earlier the better. But most studios and filmmakers probably don't think that way. Any other experience, Chaitan, with 
the films that have been made from your books? Have you well, met the composers? Well, music is a very, very important part of Indian cinema. I mean, it is the songs I used to market the film, and then, of course, the background score also. What I found, at least, is that some of times the, the background person and all, they are not briefed, or the entire unit, forget, even the lighting person, even the costumes person. They found having a book helpful, because even though, you know, the screenplay is limited, they can tell you so much, but they have their full book, uh, they get into that world, they can get inspired, they can get characters, it gives a head start, and even the junior most lighting person knows what they are being made, what is being made. And I think somewhere down the line, it has an impact to make a better product. I'd like to believe, like the composer, if he knows that, okay, this was the story and it's four times the size as the screenplay, they'll get some other mood, some other, I, I don't really even know how music is made and I have a lot of respect for music makers, but I think they like the fact that there's a book out there which has a world and I have to create music for that world. And I, for me, that's one of the big joys of the adaptation because a book can't have music. Uh, a film has music and it, it reaches people in a, it, a, you know, it makes a different effect. So I would, I would think the having a, working on adaptation must be more satisfying for a composer, maybe, because they have a book they can read. If they do that, maybe they don't read the book, that's different, but, you know. Uh, there's a question up front, and then we'll take. Hi. Uh, I come from the world of nonfiction and where some of the non-fiction that we write is more fiction than anything else. But, Michael, you spoke about, you know, when you have a novel and there's a higher story above it, that from which the question is all very simple because, you know, the kind of communication world that I come out from, you think of a concept, you translate into a brochure, you translate into a film, you translate into internet, you know, in, in the form of communication. Now, how do we kind of express that and put it in? As far as music, is concerned, it does fit in beautifully because uh, I think everything is in audiovisual. Like a book is a minus visual and radio is minus pictures. So this is something, you know, that how does one, you know, kind of express that concept in a more tangible form so that, you know, you can easily go into a novel while you may want to maintain the integrity of some of your novels. But this is some novels are not filmable. Now, if there is an original thing that can be turned, I mean, this is where I was having a bit of a little, you know, billiard ball playing in my head, and not all the balls were going in the pocket. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll try to answer that. You know, there is, you can call it the moral compass well, just, of any story is there. And, um, and that is why I think someone mentioned working with the original writers sometimes can be very helpful. If you, they, there are drawbacks of working with the original writer, but, for example, I mentioned that Kaipoche was about India's youth, which is aspiring to become big, and, but it's not able to make it. They are, the, they are looking at the world changing, but they're not able to get it. That's never mentioned in the story. That's never there. But I had to tell, and I think through the director, because he put me in and one of the screenwriters, he had a chance to understand why I wrote this story. The story may be about three boys living somewhere, their friendship, whatever. But the reason is there's an entire generation in India which is not getting their due with all the economic reforms happening. That's never mentioned in the novel. The word economic reforms is not mentioned. It's a story. But since he understood that, it, we were able to create that visual, that these guys are dreaming about having a car, but actually it's just a car that's trans, a truck that's transporting cars to between cities or whatever. So I think it is hard to put it down. I, I could do a... Con a concept note, I could do a note on saying that this is what I was trying to do. And it came out like this. Another thing people say is that how true is the film to the book? But I took it like there were some criticisms of the book. And I said, let's not repeat those mistakes in the film because this, this, this did not work. Rather than saying, um, you know, the film should stay true to the original, I agree with him that the original is not even the book. The original is something in the author's head or, like he said, in the cosmos, or if you're a tech guy, it's in the cloud computing <laughs> somewhere, uh, which sinks. But often, why things are written is, is, is like Life of Pi, the moral. I'm sure if you get Jan Martel here, he'll have something very different to say on why he wrote that story and what is it about. And maybe from there, you'll really understand why the story worked. It isn't about the tiger. 
it isn't about it's about something spiritual it is about faith actually life of pi is about faith when you tell a story you only believe it because there is faith those characters are not there when you believe in god you only it only works if there is faith so that that is the real life of pi story to me it's not there in the book and it's not even there in the film but that drives now you want to make a play on life of pi it should have something from there if you want to make a tv series if you want to i don't know make anything make a even a statue coming from life of pi should convey that in some way would you agree like yeah i completely i mean i don't yes about yes no wait, wait, wait. <laughs> uh, to see no. what happens here is now i saw a film at the wild screen festival the same film it's a story where for the japanese market they have this lovely stretched out comfortable way of showing it the same for a german or audience it's you know far more and an american audience in your face rapid pace now here we are talking of you know bilingual chinese scripts and and we've come here from india to pick up things in like that now what works with whom you know when we are trying to translate a concept a novel or i mean as a writer director this is what it is the do. ultimate challenge i think the crossover i think you're talking of what crosses over yes. and for example three idiots crossed over very well now it's a story on indian education system but what connected was this chinese education system is also similar i don't think the makers ever thought that this movie has china potential they made it i think the lesson i have learned so far is people are interested in people and if you can truly show a person's suffering or a person's emotions and market it reasonably well it has enough because without marketing it's not going to happen slum dog slum dog crossed over i don't even know whether it's a western film or an indian film but danny boyle name was enough for westerners to trust that film and once they saw it they loved it so i think the more it it there is it is very difficult to plan it in a way like i write a story about a indian boy in a chinese university falling in love with a chinese girl will it do better in china maybe maybe but there is no only if the story has soul you know only if it really it's not designed to mo- uh, to sell i i feel and i think crossover will happen over time as the world integrates as we know china better we'll understand chinese movies better as china knows india better maybe it's a long way away 10 20 years away but it is about people i think it's people to people connection that has worked in life of why people connect to that pie what if i was stranded like that I, it's then it doesn't matter the boy is indian or whatever right so i just want to add one thing because what you said this and you asked of your question too which is that and like as i said because i'm on the foreign language committee so i see a lot of movies it's in this asian film festival you know films from many many countries you look at them you see them you see them as one thing. america unfortunately keeps its doors shut to so many different styles of storytelling so many different ways of of approaching stories and the american way of of storytelling is dominant because it's exciting and fast paced and emotional and visceral and loud and but and i but there are other ways of telling stories and i and and the stronger y'all make your movies the better i don't know that it's ever going to penetrate the american market the way the american market penetrates the rest of the world but i hope so okay one final question we're running out of time oh oh somebody stole the microphone from uh oh <laughs> i got Thank it don't worry sharing. um So I'm actually coming at this from a novelist standpoint turned screenwriter and I'm struggling to get my novel published at the moment. I'm not sure why but um I was wondering how much I'm th- considering self-publishing and I was wondering if there's a market for anybody turning self-published novels like online through Amazon into movies. Yes, there is. If it sells enough. So would you Whoa. recommend Exactly. Wool. Well, <laughs> That's phenomenal that. success. And and to some degree even even 50 shades of gray. Actually, no, that started the same way. So write a big S&M science fiction story, <laughs> publish it on on uh, for women, publish it on, <laughs> on, on Amazon and come back and, and take us all out to dinner. Actually in Japan it, there was a whole 
a whole um, group of stories that were told by um, right authors directly onto cell phones. And that became a trend to turn those into dr dramas and films. Um, I don't think the States has gotten quite to that level, but, but in Japan it was huge. But uh, yeah, I think self-publishing is a great way to go forward if you can push that book and get it to the right people. Uh, and in the case of Wool, as you were mentioning, it, it's now with a publishing house and potentially I presume there's a lot of interest in film rights. Um, so, yes. Okay, very quick, please. And please, uh, hello. Uh, there is one more good sample. Please let us know what do you think about Cloud Atlas releasing, you know, based on the novel of Dave Mitchell. It was, it has fallen in the U.S., but um, got good oh, nice. grosses in uh, Russia. I, I watched Cloud Atlas on the plane coming over. Uh -huh. Um, he, David Mitchell was originally supposed to be on this panel. He's not. So I can't speak to it, really. But um, I thought that that was an unfilmable book, and they proved it. I'm glad he said it. <laughs> Some people liked it. it, it was and it was China. a great book. Yeah. But I loved the book. What? Great book, but it, there was... they. Needed some, it needed something. Okay. Um, I think we have to wrap up for time, but I'm yes. going to ask you all to maybe look ahead five years. What do you think will be different about adaptations? Are people still going to Tweet be... the movie. Okay, you could... Yes, you could have some tweets adapted, perhaps. Or uh, I think we just... I think the digital, and, the digital yeah. is... is, is has only, the digital effect on everything has only just begun. I think if there's one trend, I think that one of the things that's going to happen in terms of storytelling is that the American 12-episode arc limited series, which is doing really well, live streaming on, on Netflix, I think you're going to see a lot more of that. And Marisha, you know, looking at China, what do you think is going to happen in China? Well, what I, I hope is going to be happening in China, well, not just China, but that there are more, as you were saying, Michael, more Asian stories that are available to English language audiences. And I think it's coming, but I think it's going to take a while to get there. But I think we, continue, we need to continue um, making them and working with them to, um, so that they're out there and have international audiences. But it will take a while. Yeah, I think, um, you know, my worries on books. I worry that they, there's an entire Facebook generation uh, native Facebook generation. We, all of us here at least remember the days when there was no internet. Some of us do. Uh, some of the younger people here don't. But there's an entire generation that's growing up in uh, extremely connected, extremely low ex attention spans and extremely poor reading habits. And that is a concern uh, that it's all going to be quick, fast-paced, quick consumption uh, business will go on. I think the commerce will adapt to people's new minds, which have very small attention spans. They only want to hear certain kinds of stories. So, so I think, and all that will grow with social networks, with all, uh, with movies being streamed on your phones. All that will grow the business. But there is a certain risk. I feel that the ideas, original ideas in society, uh, will will deteriorate, especially among the, the consumption of high culture, or not even high culture, even mid-brow culture may go down. We, we may all be dumbed down further. I don't want to end on a sad note, but I, I think that, that is one risk that the commerce and the, all this will be used properly. But I'm also hoping that there will be enough bold people out there. At the end of the day, it, the film industry requires some bold people who make a lot of money on five films but then make that one film which they don't care whether it made money or not or they, they don't care if it made too much money, they just make sure it covers cost. We, we will always need filmmakers like that, writers, producers, directors who are so passionate. There are filmmakers abroad who work for very little money uh, just because the concept is good and they'll make the biggest movies and the smallest movies. Same for actors, same writers need to do. I need to be happy that if the movie is great, I need to work on it for 10% of what I charge or 1% of what I charge, but just so that that movie is made. And until we do that, um, something will be lost in the numbers, I feel. Okay. Um, I think that the meaning of adaptation itself will become even more complicated than it is today. 
there's a huge influence. You can adapt a documentary into a film. You can adapt a video game into a film or a game or a film into a video game or a tweet. It's going to just get more and more and more that way. So what an adaptation is, what is truly an original screenplay, those lines will blur and we will all influence each other and it will make our lives as producers very complicated but also present an interesting array of opportunities. Okay, so complicated but hopeful. Complicated but hopeful. That's a good note to end on. Um, We're run out of time to show Flowers of War, so everybody go on YouTube later and watch the Flowers of War clip because it is a very interesting model and a success of an adaptation. I um, wanted to thank Filmart for having this panel. It was really fascinating to hear from all these experts. So a round of applause for them. And thanks for being a great audience with some great questions as well. So thank you, everybody.